We have now spent a fair bit of time talking about potential energy, and we have derived several important results that are associated with it. There is, however, one aspect of what we have done that is unsatisfactory, and that is that all the forces, all the conservative forces that give rise to the potential energies we've discussed, have been assumed as coming from the outside of the system. Yet we know, of course, that by Newton's third law, Every force actually results from the interaction of two particles, two objects. And those could both be part of your system, and frequently they are. You're frequently dealing with, with particles that are interacting with each other. So here, for instance, is one particle, and there is another. And you are quite likely to have... Um, uh, ...forces that uh, act between the two particles like this. And the formalism that we work with so far does not allow us to uh, define a potential entity that's associated with, with these types of forces, right? So here's force on particle one from particle two, force on particle two from particle one, which by Newton's second law is equal to minus F12. We don't have a way of uh, incorporating these types of forces into our potential entity scheme. And that's a, that's a big lack. The purpose of this video is to do exactly that, to show that we can actually extend the concept of the potential energy to, to this particular situation. So again, so what we need we need potential energy that is associated with interaction forces. And ultimately, of course, all forces are interaction forces. So let's focus on this force here, F12, the force on particle 1 from particle 2. Now, it depends on both the position of particle 1 and the position of particle 2. So let's just draw that here. So that's R1, and that's R2, and we also have the distance between, or the vector that connects the two particles here, two particles here, I'm going to draw that over there, I'm going to call that a vector R, that's just R1 minus R2, okay? So now if we're working with the force F12, we know... Uh, that it depends, in general, on both R1 and on R2. So no, that way it's different from the forces, that, the conservative forces we've been working with up to now, in that it depends on two positions instead of one. Um, and we know, like I said before, that it's equal to minus F21. Okay. And we're also going to assume that what we're working with here is translationally invariant. So we have translational invariance. That is to say, it doesn't matter uh, where in, in space you have uh, these particles. You can shift them some distance in any direction, and the physics stays the same. The forces between these two particles are the same, whether I draw them here or over here. So because of that, the force doesn't depend independently on R1 and R2. It really only depends on the difference of the two. So what we really have is that the force between one and particle one and two depends on R1 minus R2, or simply just a vector R. So for example, if the force we're working with is the force of gravity, then we know that F12, well, so this guy has some mass M1, and this is mass M2, then the force is going to be minus GM1 M2, divided by the distance between them squared, that's R2, and it's acting in the opposite direction of the unit vector from particle 2 towards particle 1. So I'm going to draw here. 
that's the unit vector r hat right there. Uh, another way we can draw, we can write this is as minus g m1 m2 divided by r cubed times the vector r. Okay. Now since r is r1 minus r2, this is of course minus g m g2. times vector r1 minus vector r2 divided by vector r1 minus vector r2, their magnitude squared. And uh, similarly, if you were to calculate the force on particle 2 from particle 1, uh, that amounts to the same thing. We, we just have to switch r1 and r2 for, uh, for one another. So we get minus g m1 m2 times vector r2 minus vector r1. And that's of course equal to minus f12 as expected. Now because we have translational invariance, apologize for the handwriting, and because we have translational invariance, we can uh, move the origin anywhere we like. So we are perfectly free to, to uh, pick the origin such that the vector r2 is zero. And in that case, of course, we get that f12 will depend only on r1 explicitly. So that f12 is a function only of R1. Now we know that this is a conservative force. Yeah, in fact, we, we proved it in uh, a previous video. This is conservative. So um, that means that the curl of F of R is zero. Or F12 of R is zero. So this means that we can write that F12 equals minus the gradient of some potential that depends on R. So now we've been able to write the force here, the force uh, on particle 1 from particle 2 as the gradient of a potential. It's not quite general, though, because for this formula to work, we have to have R2 equal to zero. You have to place the origin at this particle. And that works when you only have two particles to work with, but when you have more, you can't do that anymore. So to generalize this, we have to translate back. So, so we have to translate so that R2 is no longer different from, is no longer equal to zero. So it's different from zero. Uh, that specifically now gives us that force F12 equals the gradient, I'm going to use a subscript 1 there and explain it in a second, with a minus sign of U, which depends on R1 minus R2. This subscript here uh, indicates that you're taking the gradient with respect to R1. This is a gradient with respect to R1 and not R2. We have two positions, right? If I want to write this out uh, explicitly, let's first frame this just to indicate its importance. So explicitly, what, what this means is that uh, if I take the gradient of U with respect to uh, uh, R1, that means the following vector, right? It's du with respect to the x1, comma du with respect to the y1, partial du over partial the z1, uh, where the vector r1 is taken to be x1, y1, z1. Okay, uh, and we can also show, and this is going to be on the homework, 
that if I take the gradient with respect to R1 of U, which depends on R1 minus R2, then that's minus the gradient with respect to R2 of the same function. So because of that, uh, we obtain our final result that if we have that the curl of the force F12, which depends on R1 minus R2, then we can write And that works, of course, because um, because of this, and because f12 has to be equal to uh, minus f21. Oh, I forgot the important part. This has to be equal to zero. And if that is true, then we have this. So this is the uh, now the second condition of having a conservative force, but applied to interacting particles. Right. And the first condition is already satisfied because we know that the force depends only on position. There's no time dependence explicitly, no velocity dependence or anything like that. So if we can write this, and the force depends only on position, then it is conservative in the exact same sense that it, uh, we have used the whole time. And therefore we can write down the forces as gradients of positions, uh, as gradients of potentials, even though the potentials depend on the uh, location of more than one particle. So in this case, U is known as the interaction potential. Between particle 1 and 2. So we need to note that uh, U is associated now, it's a potential energy that's associated both with particle 1 and particle 2. In other words, there's no potential energy specifically associated just with particle 1, or specifically associated just with particle 2. The potential energy U is associated with the interaction between the two. Okay, so we can't, uh, we can't assign it to one particle or the other in this case. Okay, uh, let's next make a copy of this. What we're going to consider now is what happens to the mechanical energy. Since now U is actually something that's shared between two particles, but each particle here by itself will have its own kinetic energy. So let's consider the kinetic energy. And if you look at uh, small changes, a small differential change in the total kinetic energy, uh, those are due to the forces acting during some small displacement of the particles. So we can say that change in the kinetic energy of particle 1 is the force on that particle, scalar dr1, that's the work energy theorem, right? And then same thing for particle 2 except now it's a force is F21 scalar dr2. This is the work energy theorem. Okay, uh, so let's now look at the total kinetic energy. That's of course equal to dt1 plus dt2, and we can just write that as That makes sense, right? So now we have the change in kinetic energy of this particle due to the change of its position and the force acting on it. Same thing for particle 2. That's all we expressed here. But we can rewrite it because we know uh, that Newton's third law is valid. And that means that we can uh, write this as... like that. Now we know that F12 is given by this over here, and we can relate this then to become 
uh, we know, of course, that we have defined R as R1 minus R2. So we get that way we don't have to worry about the subscripts, right? And that equals just minus to U. Uh, so just as a reminder, if that's difficult to see, um, the gradient of U, which is a function of R, is du dx, comma du dy, comma du dz, and then we take the scalar part of that with R, dx, dy, dz, and we know that that is just going to be equal to to be equal to du dx dx plus du dy dy plus du dz dz and by the chain rule that's just equal to the differential du okay so this is just an expression of the chain rule for differentials. So we have the t is minus du, which is the same as to say that d of t plus u equals zero. In other words, t1 plus t2 plus total potential is conserved. which is just what we wanted to obtain, right? So now we have everything that we had for a, a conservative force that comes from some external uh, external source. But for the case when we are working with uh, particles that are interacting with each other. Um, the next step now is to um, extend this to more than two particles, but we will relegate that to the next video because this one is already getting uh, too long.